Okay, week 17, the title to this message is Future Plans. So Moses wrote Psalm 90, and here's what Moses says. He says, teach us to number our days that we may get or achieve or acquire a heart of wisdom. And even though Moses and other places in the scripture say the same thing, even though Moses tells us to number our days, to recognize there is a limit to them, we often seem to get comfortable. We coast. We assume that our lives will be long and full and, and lasting. But really, even a long life is short. Maybe 70 years or more if you're lucky. Frankly, tragically, many lives are even shorter than that. The fact is, we don't have an endless supply of days. Our lives are a vapor, and when, when, when in, in the book of Ecclesiastes, the word vapor really means our life is vanity. Often when we make plans, we don't act like a vapor, though, do we? We operate as though we're some sort of immovable concrete pillar. <laughs> do your most ambitious plans and personal, or whether they be personal or professional, or maybe financial plans, do you consider the cost or impact on the kingdom of God? Are most of your professional or financial decisions driven primarily by a spreadsheet? Or do the values that Jesus taught us throughout the Sermon on the Mount, on the Mount do they have an equal impact in your calculations as the numbers might? Do you find that you're constantly forging ahead with plans, whether they be big plans or, or small plans, you, you forge ahead without wise counsel from those within your church family? Do you even have a church you call your family? And when you pray for your plans, are your prayers primarily that God would, you know, pave the way smooth for your plans to be successful? Is that how you pray? Are you more focused on your comfortable retirement plan than how you can make sure that you're a relentless servant of God to your community of believers until you end this life? See, this is what today's passage is dealing with, this, this constant tension that we all feel between our plans and God's plans, and the humility that is to honestly pray, your will be done, and truly mean it when you do it. James chapter 4, verse 13 through 17, come now, you who say, today or tomorrow, we will go into such and such a town and spend a year there and trade and make a profit, yet you do not know what tomorrow will bring. What is your life? For you are a mist that appears for a little time and then vanishes. Instead, you ought to say, if the Lord wills, we will live and do this or that. As it is, you boast in your arrogance. All such boasting is evil. So whoever knows the right thing to do it and fails to do it for him, it is sin. Another bright, cheery passage from the book of James. <laughs> <laughs> There's some interesting history here. I want you to understand what was going on in the first century church. I want you to see that there was this future promise that people in the church lived by, right? James is providing another test of our ropes of faith about priority this time. And it's all connected, once again, as we've seen throughout this series, this is all directly taken from and connected to what Jesus taught on the Sermon on the Mount. This is the passage in the Sermon on the Mount that this is driven from. Matthew 6, 33. Seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. Then all these things will be added to you. Therefore, don't be anxious or arrogant about tomorrow. For tomorrow will be arrogant or anxious for itself. So do you know people who are absolutely convinced that Jesus is going to return very soon in our lifetime? I know people like that. I mean, I hope he does, but I know people that are just, oh, he's coming. <laughs> this confidence is usually centered on some sort of hidden knowledge or interpretation of events that they've been taught or some obscure, out-of-context interpretation of random Bible verses or maybe even some sort of social media conspiracy post. Well, did you know that first century Christians, 
2,000 years ago, they were even more convinced than us that Jesus would return in their lifetime. You can understand why. Some were so confident Jesus would return, they were obsessed with predicting when it would happen. You know, ironically, we can relate to this a little bit because we saw many Christians like this last week with foolish, wild speculation and theories about the eclipse. But Jesus, didn't he clearly say, no one knows exactly when I'm going to come back? Didn't he say that? I mean, it's pretty arrogant to assume that you know the future. In fact, in the first century, some churches, like the church in Thessalonica, Paul had to specifically remind them, hey guys, I know you're looking forward to it, but stop acting like it's going to be tomorrow and selling everything and you're so convinced. Nobody knows when Jesus is going to return. You don't know what's going to happen. However, in the first century church, the promise that Jesus made that he would return was in fact expected to have a substantial impact on how they lived their lives. Titus chapter 2, verses 11 to 13, look at this. For the grace of God has appeared, bringing salvation for all people, training us to renounce ungodliness and worldly passions and to live self-controlled, upright, godly lives in the present age, waiting for our blessed hope, the appearing of the glory of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ. Many first century followers of Jesus understood they were to live in this world without being obsessed with this world. Only real faith, though, could provide the humility to understand that, to understand how to live without foolishness and still expect the return of Jesus. This expectation meant understanding what it means to live according to the very clear kingdom values Jesus taught us in the Sermon on the Mount. But over time, many, many Christians in the first century church began living in a way that seemed to forget or ignore the promises of Jesus' return. People that claimed to follow Jesus, they gave lip service to it. They even made predictions about when he might come back, but they lived as though the kingdom of God did not even exist. With their mouths, they said they were Christians, but the plans they made and the goals they set revealed they were obsessed with this life. Their highest priority became pursuing their own desires, fulfilling their own agenda, and making their own plans. In fact, in fact, they became so detached from spiritual reality, kingdom values began to have very little to no impact on how they were living. This is the people that James is challenging with this passage. People claiming they follow Jesus, but living their lives as though God doesn't really matter. Week after week after week. That's the history. Theology, what about God? What is he doing? I want you to see that there's this exposing of arrogant planners. So James starts with a very provocative tone, okay? Come now. If you'll allow me, let me translate that for you. Hold on a minute. Wait a second. What is wrong with you? Are you stupid? No, no. I added that one. I'm sorry. That was me. Sorry. But, but James is incredulous. How can you say that you have faith and at the same time plan your life as though God is irrelevant to it? Look at you big shots. Proud of your big plans for money and success. Bragging to everyone about your next move. You think you've got the future all figured out, don't you? You think you have it all under control. Give me a break. Yes, James is using very heavy sarcasm, which makes me a little uncomfortable because, because as you know, church, I'm not one who's comfortable with that type of rhetorical tool. <laughs> I'm not a sarcastic guy. <laughs> this example of traveling to a city for a year to buy and sell and make a profit is an illustration of something much deeper. It's an example of the friendship with the world that James was talking about earlier that makes us pursue our internal personal passions that he talked about, the ones that make us fight with each other. It's an example of anyone who lives as though they are in control, focused primarily on their own agenda. 
It's a warning about forgetting that your life is a very brief moment in the grand scheme of the kingdom of God. It's a warning to those who say they follow Jesus, but have little or no space or resources or time for service in the kingdom of God. What is wrong with you? Can't you see how silly all your plans are? Your life is like steam coming off your morning coffee. There's a good daily reminder. Jesus also taught himself how foolish and arrogant it is to make plans without considering your frail mortality. In this parable in Luke 12, look what he says. He told them a parable saying, the land of a rich man produced plentifully. And he thought, what shall I do? I have nowhere to store my crops. I will tear down my barns and build larger ones and store all my grains and goods. I will say to my soul, soul, you have ample goods laid up for many years. Relax, eat, drink, be merry. But God said to him, fool, this night your soul is required of you. The things you prepared, whose will they be? So is the one who lays up treasure for himself and is not rich toward God. You have all these big plans. You assume not only that you have tomorrow, but also that you'll have many years after that. You've made your life's work building a barn to preserve your huge harvest, but tomorrow you're going to die. That's what he's saying. See, Jesus and James are both making it very clear. There's no ambiguity here. He's making it very clear how preposterous it is to say we have faith, but live and plan without God or to live and plan with him as an afterthought. If your ropes of faith are secure, it's impossible for this kind of life planning to persist consistently in the heart of a true follower of Jesus. This kind of planning at its core is rooted in arrogance. It's someone who truly believes he's in full control of his own destiny. But listen, this warning isn't just about business or, or investment. That is an example or a metaphor for any earthly priority we put before our humble obedience to the God who has saved us. It could be things like your possessions, your career ambition, your reputation or status. It could be your politics. And look, these things that I just listed, I don't want you to, they aren't evil by themselves. But James says pursuing them before we pursue the kingdom of God makes them evil. Secure ropes of faith don't allow the kingdom of God to be consistently relegated to being a mere afterthought. Real faith is always constantly, real faith is always constantly course correcting us. Making the kingdom of God the center of everything we do. Real faith is that force that even though we don't understand why, it is this spiritual gravity that seems to always bring everything in our lives back to proper orbit around the kingdom of God. That's the theological section. What about the personal? What are we supposed to do with this? If the Lord wills. This was the sermon preview this week. The way you plan your life on earth is a powerful indication of what kind of faith you have in Jesus. So, this truth is hard-hitting, and at first, though, it seems like it's an easy concept, right? Okay, don't make plans before consulting God. Easy enough, right? Let me tell you something. All week I was wrestling with this because clearly the tone that James has, he's not saying, oh, by the way, check with God first. He's got a tone here that indicates there's something much deeper going on. You see that, right? The lesson isn't some, this isn't some clever stoic proverb. This is an intense, clear, by design, provocative Warning that is intended to be taken very seriously. He starts with, hey, come on now. This is more than just an instruction to business people to seek guidance or permission from God before making money. And this is not about how to correct a, a simple mistake or oversight of forgetting to check with God when you make your plans. It's deeper than that. He's not just saying that making plans without asking God for help is some small mistake fixed by this magical phrase, if the Lord wills. Oh, I'm going to go and I'm going to get an expensive car if the Lord wills. That's not what he's saying. 
this reveals a much deeper, more serious flaw that when persistent, exposes your ropes of faith are in fact not secure. It's an arrogant way of living that exposes what kind of wisdom you are following, which would be the earthly, sensual, demonic kind that he warned about in chapter 3. And if this condition has been exposed and you keep living this way, it means your ropes of faith are not steady. It's a warning to anyone who plans out their life as though the kingdom of God is a second priority. It's a warning to those certain about what needs to be done. And then constantly stunned when life changes the mathematical equations. It's a warning to anyone whose priorities reveal there is no true surrender to God because they aren't really true worshipers. They're convenient worshipers. This is a warning to all, regardless of what they say, who have made their own selfish future desires their top priority in their plans. It's the person who makes future plans, big or small, and never considers how those fans might those plans might fit into the kingdom of God. And see what James is doing, he's revealing this, this spiritual insanity, if you will, of being unable to recognize that you don't control much of anything really in this life. This is someone who considers themselves kingdom-minded, but spends very little time in actual kingdom service. Oh, perhaps occasionally, and not by your own design, your priorities possibly intersect with God's priorities because God's plan is huge. But that intersection was never really your core desire when you made your plans. It just became a convenient coincidence, but we'll certainly take credit for it. <laughs> but even then, we misread the convenient incidental intersection as a sign that we are following Jesus and he has signed off on our plans. Now listen. Let me make sure this is very clear. James is not condemning the idea of wise planning. He's not. He isn't saying planning for the future itself is evil. It is not. It is wise and we should. And, and we are instructed in other places in Scripture to plan. Look, it is one thing for an unbelieving person to plan their life without regard to God. That is to be expected. But claiming to follow Jesus and then planning our life in complete disregard for God's will, that is an incompatible equation. James is making sure that we understand this. And it's the same test he's been driving home throughout this letter. Here's the test. If your ropes of faith are secure, they will provide a, cum a humble, constant reliance that makes you hold on tight to those ropes of faith. There will be this ever-present, constantly course-correcting desire to surrender everything to God and his kingdom, even when we start picking them up for ourselves along the way. In fact, if your ropes of faith are secure, this is the miracle and the joy that only a follower of Jesus can understand. If your ropes of faith are secure, you're actually never more satisfied in this life than when you are in complete surrender. And it doesn't mean that we are always in surrender perfectly all the time. We're not. But when we do stray, we will quickly know when we have taken steps the wrong way. All right, if the Lord wills. Colossians chapter 3, verse, uh, second half of verse 1 and 2. Look what it says. Seek the things that are above, where Christ is, seated at the right hand of God. Set your minds on things that are above, not on things that are on earth. See, if your ropes of faith are secure, this phrase, if the Lord wills, is also much deeper than it seems to be at first glance. It's not a magical prayer or a ritual or some spiritual legal disclaimer, a verbal sprinkling of holy water that sanitizes your earthly plans. It's much more than that. Do you understand that? It's meant to be an expression of a deeper passion for followers of Jesus of complete surrender to what God wants. It's an expression of the redeemed heart as much as it is the redeemed mouth. Acknowledging that our lives are no longer our own. 
It's more than just acknowledging God's in control. It's a way of saying, God, I am glad you're in control. I am thankful you're sovereign because I keep screwing things up. It conveys a deep, desperate reliance on our precious Jesus for anything and everything we may be called to do. Yes, we plan, and yes, we discern, and yes, we do our best to navigate this life and to be prepared for the things that we can't see coming, but even these plans for the follower of Jesus will be rooted in absolute faith in God's sovereignty. So question for you. This is not for you. To, I'm not telling you to answer this out loud, so don't. Okay? What is God's plan for your life? Do you really want to know what it is? And do you really want to pursue it? Look, we are tempted to answer with a typical servicey church answer. Well, of course. But I'm talking about something much deeper than a churchy answer. Do you have a real, passionate, consistent, faith-based yearning for what God wants for your life? If you say yes, what is the evidence for this deep yearning? Do your plans and priorities confirm your yes? How often are your prayers patterned after how Jesus taught us to pray? Your kingdom come, your will be done. You know, I feel like more often, at least for me, I slip into this pattern where our prayers are the kind that James warns us about for things that we can consume for ourselves. Most often it seems we want God to rubber stamp or endorse our plans instead of leading us into his plan. And when things don't turn out the way we planned, Suddenly, the kingdom has become an obstacle instead of a detour. So if your ropes of faith are secure, you will have this, this daily, maybe not daily, maybe weekly, this course-correcting yearning for obedience and submission to God's plan because you'll know when it's missing. Of course, we will all constantly struggle with wanting to go our own way, probably more than once each day we do this, but being able to recognize our personal agenda in those moments that our personal agenda starts to overshadow the kingdom of God, being able to recognize that, listen, if you can say, wow, this, this plan looks good, but it may not be God's plan, being able to see that is a precious affirmation of your faith. It reveals our grip on our ropes might be slipping, and reminds you to reassess and realign our hearts with the will of God. And when that happens, our prayers become prayers of humility, priority, and sobriety. Perhaps you're here today and you feel like, you know what, Pastor Joe, I, I think I need some course correcting. Well, that's good. That means your ropes of faith are secure. It's those who can't see the course-correcting needs that have something to worry about. But if that's you today, and you feel like you need a little course-correcting, allow me to lead you in this kind of prayer today, a prayer for humility and priority and sobriety. Dear Jesus, you say that if we ask you for wisdom, you'll give it to us. Lord, the fact that we are asking shows that you have given us the gift of humility through faith. Lord, we ask that you would keep us humbly submitted to your will and not our master earthly plan. Remind us of our frailty. Remind us that our life is just vanity. It's a, it's a vapor, steam off our coffee. Remind us that we desperately need to be humbly reliant upon you. And Jesus, we pray that you would help us realign our priorities. Help us put your kingdom and your church first. Lord, help us to learn what it means to put our plans in pencil and your kingdom plans in concrete. And Lord, we do pray for sobriety. Jesus, may the faith you've given us keep us aware and focused on you first before what we want, before our own plans. Father, we pray for this. We pray 
for humility. Priority. And sobriety. And Lord, the fact that you have given us that desire to pray that today as we read this warning about earthly plans, Lord, we thank you that you've given us desire because that is a sign that our robes of faith are indeed secure. And we ask for this humility, this priority, and this sobriety in the name of our precious Jesus. Amen.